<laughs> Hello, freak bitches. And before I forget, the reason I wanted to show that video was I got you something. This is Leo May's wife. So you have the you have the the knife from Leo May. His wife made you this right here. And so because from our second JRE episode, I believe, uh, we funded a water well there in Bobofi. And so uh, she's really talented. Um, I mean, it might not look like too much here, but... Uh, no, it's cool. What is yeah, it made out of? It's bark cloth. Wow. So it's uh, tree bark cloth. And when they take the, the bark off the trees, fine. But they, uh, that used to be what they would make their clothing out of. Their clothing, they would make other materials out of them. Uh, they can make these little kind of carrying cases or backpacks kind of out of it. Do they treat it with something? Like, how do they get it so soft? They pound it down. And I haven't seen the whole process, but I've seen the bark and where they pull it off. And then they kind of beat it down and beat it down um, until it's this, like, cloth. I know that this right here, wow. when I've been doing research, they have those pygmy, uh, Mabuti pygmy paintings that are made out of bark cloth at like our National Museum of History in New York. Um, they have a few of these there, and so it's kind of cool to see. I don't know. I just was uh, was excited to bring it back oh, to you. I think awesome, I got a picture of uh, said painting, oh, and well. um, it's it's Mama Leo May, and she's uh, she's painting it for you. So that's awesome, man. Thank you. Yeah, and thank her, please. I will. That's so cool. I will. They wow. just have, when I go back, sometimes they're like, hey. Like oh, that's for making it there? Think your friends. Yeah, so wow. that one's not the same one. I actually didn't think to, or I didn't get a picture of it whenever she was painting this one, but I got a picture of her doing some other ones. That's Mama Swazi, and uh, she's pretty great at it as well. And um, so they just, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a little bowl, little leaves. Um, this paint that you actually have there was, they had some leftover black paint, but sometimes on that other photo, they just use like cassava or berries and they beat it up, uh, pound it down and make this paint out of it, but it kind of fades over time. So this one's one where, yeah, that's, that's it right there where they just pound up the stuff and it's part of their culture. It's what they love to do. They kind of how you saw Leo May uh, passing down, uh, you know, the farming and that video was actually San Gui over here from that handprint that you, oh. that you got, the, it's his grandson. Um, and this is what the women pass down to their girls is how to make the spark cloth and how to, um, how to paint. So wow. it's pretty neat. Their culture, like they just do everything together. They rally around each other. They're happy together. They sing, they dance, but they also suffer together. If one person in the community is lost, even for instance, uh, so it might sound weird in our culture, but let's say a mother passes away who's like she's breastfeeding right and she passes away but the baby survives some other woman in the village will take the baby up and start uh, taking care of that little one and um, there is an adoption in the pygmy culture like you no one no one needs to be adopted because the community rallies around them when someone's lost they all mourn the death together but then they rally around that family and see how they can all help and put in so it's pretty cool. I love it. I've I've learned a lot from them. Well, that's how people used to be, man. Yeah. That's that's the original sort of tr tribal life of human beings. They they would all raise each other. Christopher Ryan had this whole um, uh, take on it in Sex at Dawn, you know, and and McKenna had a take on it as well, uh, where they were talking about these ancient cultures. They because of these small groups of people, they they were much closer. They they knew everyone in the community. It was intensely important, and that they, there's a lot of people that think that some of the problems that we deal with today in society are because of this disassociation that we have Absolutely. with our neighbors, and we don't have a real sense of community. I mean, I know like two or three of my neighbors, and I see them once a year. Yeah. You know, I say hi, wave, how's everything, man? Everything cool? All right, good seeing you. But that's it. You know, yeah. there's no real community. There's no interaction. There's no, there's certainly no contribution as far as like working together to gather food or water mm -hmm. or anything like that. And I would imagine that these people were just intensely close. Yeah, absolutely, man. That must have been a big part of the attraction <clears throat> to you, to them, like when they took you in and you were right. living with them. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the average. Mabuti Pygmy Village is only 85 to 150. On our 10 villages that we help and have the 3,000 acres of land, um, it's over 300 uh, for each, each village. Um, Do you know about Dunbar's number? Mm -mm. Dunbar's number is a, a number that, I mean, it varies, but the number somewhere around 150 for most people. There's huh. a, a number of people that you can keep close relationships with. Oh, wow. That you really only have room 
for 150 people in your head. You essentially have hard drive space. Wow. Yeah, and that seems to be related to ancient tribal communities that people that had sense. that we developed that way yeah we developed these these small groups of 50 to 150 plus people yeah and no, then when that, you get larger than that things get weird yeah well no that's that's so true like i whenever i went through the six-year battle with oxy and just uh narcotics or pain pills like i i um i don't know i would always be able to isolate super easy right because when you're in your home you're completely alone yeah, um yeah and so it's different when you're in a village and with the pygmies you saw some of those huts how how small they are yeah you know uh seriously in several of them whenever i'm sleeping i have to sleep in the center and i have to have my feet out the door um yeah. because it's so small uh but it's um the only go in there when you're going to sleep uh, or if you're not feeling good and you need some rest or the sun's right over your head and you're hot. Um, but besides that, you're cooking, your kitchen's outside. Um, that's where the people is. That's where you do life is outside of your home, uh, around the campfire. We call it Campfire University because that's where we've been taken to school from the, uh, from the pygmies. Uh, that's where they teach us the most about life is around the campfire, learning their culture, learning about their kids learning about the hunts, learning about how they make this, make that. Um, and it's where you get to do life together. And so it's something really, really cool. Uh, honestly, I told them they want to know a bit, little bit about my life. And I told them that I went through drug, drug addiction for six years and you know, they don't really struggle with that at all. And, uh, and then I told them I got really depressed and I told them I got really sad. And I told them that I got so sad that I decided one time to take as many pills as I could and drink, uh, it was like half a bottle of Everclear or more, um, and snorted a bunch of Coke and just wanted to end it all. So, I mean, I, I told him that I was suicidal and, um, and I can't, I, I, I won't ever forget how they, how they looked at me almost dumbfounded in a way of like, and then, and then one of the questions the chief asked me said, well, wouldn't hurting you yourself, wouldn't hurting yourself only hurt you? And, uh, so the whole concept of, uh, I guess what I'm getting to is they had never heard of anyone killing themselves. Like, uh, maybe they had heard stories or something like that, but they have never known anybody that actually killed themselves or heard of it. It's not something that their, their community, their culture, the pygmies kind of untouched out in the forest or even not, uh, up in the cities. Like that's just something that they don't struggle with there. They're struggling so much day in and day out with struggles that are so deep and, they see their family and they do life together that I think they just have so much more of what we were just talking about, so much more of a support system, people that will rally around them. When you lose a family member, everyone rallies around you. Like whenever I go to the funerals, it's the, it's the worst thing in the world. The sounds, like people don't try to compose themselves. They don't try to dress the body real nice and have flowers all around and now now losing loss of life is always tough always terrible um but there's something we do here in our culture where we make it um try to make it as as nice or smooth or almost pretty as possible you know the person's dressed really nice and has the flowers and you compose yourself to come there you gather yourself you prepare the eulogy there's a there's a program when you step in there, people get handed something and you know what's going to happen there. So you kind of can all compose, man, there, it's just so ugly. It's so raw. It's so real. And it's so like in your face and it just rips your heart open to where people are mourning. I, I saw J. Lua, um, whenever Babo, I was the one, me and Ben were the ones that told J. Lua, he's a chief, um, about his grandson passing away. We were there when it happened. He wasn't around. He was out collecting or gathering. Um, and we met on the same path together and he saw it in our face that he knew Baba was sick, but now he knew that he was gone. And I remember Jay Lawal just falling on his back into this off the side of the footpath into like this pile of brush, like a, like, a, like probably two, three foot tall where he like sunk into it. And he was just squirming on his back. You know, he's like in his 60s. Mm. And he's watched so many of his grandchildren, like, pass just because they don't have clean water. And seeing him squirming, almost wanting to, like, crawl out of his skin, you know. Um, and so, but, I, I, I don't know. I don't want to be a bummer. I, I'm, I'm just. Uh, no, just express yourself. Don't it's, worry about that. It's, 
but then how the whole community, all 150, 200, 300 people that were there, uh, all mourned together. Like we shared it. Like I, I cried in a way that was like, <laughs> you know, like, like, right. te- like wiping my tears with everybody. Cause everyone, everyone was mourning. Everyone was crying. It wasn't just a few people. It wasn't just his mom and yeah. his dad, his mom, macho. It, it, it was, it wasn't just Jay Lua. It was the whole village cried together. And so I don't know, but for me that, that makes it seem like, I don't know if this, I don't want to make too many connections between our culture because they're completely different or a lot different. But I think here a huge cause of divorce is the loss of a child. Um, but there it almost unites the parents, um, so much so whenever they lose a little one. And I don't, I don't mean to make this comparison, but it's like, I think it's because when they mourn, they truly go to the depths of the darkest place and they're able to truly almost get it out. If that makes sense, Mm. where when you're at the funeral, you let yourself go, you just let go and, and, and it's okay. However ugly or however you handle it, whatever emotions come, you just ride that wave. If that makes sense. Do you think that because their life is so difficult that life itself becomes more precious and the loss becomes more powerful or more intense, more, more raw? Wow. Yeah, I needed you to to sum that up for sure. Um, yes, I, I do. I think whenever you struggle so much, you're, you become so much more appreciative and grateful of life, of every breath you take. Um, well, yeah. that's got to be connected to their lack of understanding of suicide because yeah. our, you know, our idea of what a difficult life is, it's difficult, but there's food and shelter and mm-hmm. there's, you know... And really the easiest place to live in the world, all those things connected. Whereas with them, just staying alive is such a struggle and getting water, which is so easy for us. Oh, we, anybody yeah. can walk in any bathroom and any gas stop, turn the water on, water comes out. I mean, yeah. everybody, you, water's not hard to get in America. Mm-hmm. I mean, even with droughts, it's easy to get water. We water fucking golf courses with millions of gallons of water every day. Yeah. Our understanding of what a struggle is is so different. Yeah, and I think whenever we, whenever we struggle here, we can go hide away, and we don't have to deal with it. Right. We don't have to have conversations about it. Um, we can, we can almost escape it. We can escape it with our, with our toys, with our technology. You know, we can, we can just bury our face in our phone or a computer or sit and watch a movie. And like, whenever those uncomfortable feelings come up, we can try to ignore them or suppress them, if that makes sense. Yeah. And there, they're so, it's almost, man, this is gonna be a weird, strange curveball or left turn, but it's almost like uh, I've started floating recently, and whenever I go in there, um, into the tank, it's like you have to, you're, you're left alone to your thoughts, right? Mm. You don't have that technology, you don't have this, and so you can deal with stuff, and you can try to focus and let go, and, and for me, it's been really beneficial, and so I don't. I know that sounds weird for me to make that connection, but uh, but whenever you're just left alone with your own thoughts, you can go deep. Yeah, and I feel like our culture here. Well, okay, in, if we compare, and I love our culture. There's, I'm not saying there's so much wrong with it, but uh, but I feel like there in relationships, you go an inch or two wide, and you go a mile deep in the Congo. You get to know people. And then here, a lot of times you go a mile wide, but you go only, you only scratch the surface. You don't go beneath the topsoil that much. Um, so you do sometimes with, with few people. Um, there's only few people we, we trust with that, you know, but it's almost like there, everyone's so open to, um, to go in deep with one another. And because of that, you get to know each other better. You get to truly hurt when they hurt. You get to laugh when they laugh. You get to cry when they cry. Um, and man, I don't, I don't have to keep going on about it, but no, it's, please it's, it's listen, uh, don't apologize. There's a real, um, there's a real argument for the, the way that we live right now is not a way that we were designed for, meaning that not that it can't be sustainable or manageable and you can't figure out a way to live a harmonious life in the modern context, right. but that a lot of people think that we're just, we would naturally fit right in, in a tribal environment, that it would feel natural. And a lot of people experience that when they go camping for long stretches of time, when they're out in the woods 
together, you know, for whatever reason. They just decide to find a, a place and live off the land. I mean, that's why I think a lot of those shows, like those um, subsistence living shows, yeah. like um, the, those... Like homesteading kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's very... Attra- it's a very attractive to people mm-hmm. because I think there's a longing in our, our DNA even where it just... There's a pull. There's a pull to that. Man, I would love to just grow kale and raise chickens mm-hmm. and live off the farm. I mean, there's a lot of people that feel like really, really attracted to that. And I think it's... It's something deep in our being that we're longing for this connection to the real world. We've done an amazing thing in creating cities. It's it's stupendous. It's a, it's almost beyond our comprehension because we're a part of it. You know, we're a part of it. It's normal. You get on the subway, you get in your car, you drive through the city. It seems normal. But it's so far removed from every single aspect of our history. Mm. I mean, this is so new. It's so recent. I think these people are just more in tune. I mean, it's horrible that they have to deal with these situations, right. like the lack of water and toilets and the diseases and all the, the, the other struggle. But man, there's a part of what they're doing and the way they're living that just seems like they're more in tune in a natural way. Yeah. Right. You would think that they would be more depressed. Right. And, uh, but but like you heard you heard Leo May's laugh in that yeah. when they asked him about the bananas and he just got tickled you know he couldn't couldn't hold himself from just laughing and saying I can't count that much you take someone from Beverly Hills and say hey this is what we got for you you can grow bananas now they're like fuck you <laughs> how do I get out of here first class only you know right where's my iPhone uh-huh. yeah. <laughs>